Welcome back, listeners, to Dark and Disturbed Tales. Now, the conclusion to The Replacements, The Day They Took Over. Are you sure we're in the right spot? There's a ton of places they could be hiding your truck. Maybe we should check some of the other freight yards. Phil scoffed. Way ahead of you, Hoss. I checked all over town before I ran into you. Matter of fact, I was resting up to come here when we met. So yeah, I'm sure. But I'll tell you what. If they ain't here, you can leave me. I gotta find Debbie. I can't take off without her. I thought about it for a long second. As the last of the train rolled by, he helped me because I, he wanted to. I didn't ask to be saved. The reality of it was, I'd be dead if it weren't for him. I owed him my life. There was no way I could ride off into the sunset knowing I was leaving him to die. If they're not there, we'll keep looking. Phil gave me an odd glance. Phil nodded once, tossed his empty beer can out the window, then put the truck in drive and hit the gas. Those six blocks passed so fast, I barely got a look at the scenery. Before I knew it, we were parked in front of a large tan building with a green roof. The area was lined with those huge industrial tanks and backdropped by the Maumee River. To our right was the truck yard, packed by 30 or 40 semis still hitched to their trailers. Now that I was looking at it, I understood why he believed his truck would be there. What I didn't understand was why anyone would keep a hostage in a place like this. It didn't seem to... It didn't seem like it was a good idea. On top of that, what were the odds they would still be alive? I didn't want to say anything, but deep down, I knew we wouldn't find Debbie or anyone else here. Getting out of the truck and stepping to the rear hatch, I opened up the barn doors. We started gearing up. As I clipped on two sets of extra ammo magazines to my belt, I put a couple more in my pockets. Phil looked around and nodded. Hell yeah, let's do this. Pack light. We want to be able to move. Primary, secondary, and sidearms only. Uh, nah, you know what? That might be a little too heavy. Knock off the secondary and let's run these beauties right here. He smiled, patting a pair of tactical shotguns. I picked up a while back. I got them at a gun show after seeing one in a movie. I even brought a box of dragon's breath rounds that I took to the range. I had a handful of these left, so I gave them to Phil. I thought he would get a kick out of them. Unfortunately, I only had two speed loaders for his Colt. If he needed more, he'd have to figure it out. On the upside, I brought fanny packs to carry shells for the shotguns. If he had some room, he could put a few extra rounds in there. Satisfied with our selection, I closed up the truck, closed the barn doors, and locked everything. I looked around. There were five buildings on the property, but only one truck yard, so it made sense to start there. After crossing a small field that separated the buildings from the yard, we came up behind the last two trucks in line. They were parked two by two, the first quarter mile or so, then spread out in rows of five. I couldn't see past them. I couldn't get a good gauge on how far they went. 
we passed the first six rigs without slowing down. It wasn't until we hit the larger section I realized I didn't know what the hell I was looking for. How does it look? In case we split up, I need to know what I'm searching for. Giving me a goofy grin, Phil came closer. She's an 85 Freightliner, FLC 120. All white with a big chrome grill and a blue and yellow stripe running right down the side of her. Her name is Pork Chop, and she's the prettiest damn thing I'd ever laid eyes on. You'll know when you see her. He nodded at me like I was supposed to know what the fuck he was talking about. So I just played along. I knew it was white with a blue and yellow stripe. That was good enough for me. To speed things up, we each took a row. If anything went wrong, we would meet in the middle and go from there. The second we split up, I was instantly overwhelmed by that goddamn silence. It was the type of quiet that makes your ears ring. It was completely unnerving. As I crept past the first rig, my mind started playing tricks on me. The sound of footsteps in the gravel behind me caused me to spin around and bring up the gun. But there was no one there. <sighs> Laughing at myself, I figured I must have been hearing Phil on the next row. When I got to the third truck, another sound stopped me in my tracks. It was a wheezing, raspy groan that instantly triggered flashbacks of Clyde dying in the street. Moving cautiously, I stepped around the front of the rig and peered into the gap between the third and the fourth trucks. At first glance, I, I couldn't see anything. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, but when they did, something came rushing towards me. It was low to the ground and moving fast. I backpedaled, bringing up the shotgun as I caught sight of it. It, it was a twisted mashup of mismatched body parts and, and ran in all fours. I didn't get a good look at its face, but from what I could tell, it had a metallic skull, partially covered with rotting flesh. Hands shaking and heart pounding, I took aim, fired, and I missed. The fucking thing leapt into the air, screaming as it dodged my first shot. Before I could get off another, it slammed into me, <clears throat> knocking me down. I hit the ground hard, but I had a death grip on the shotgun. As my ass hit the gravel, I fired another round. This one hit the fucking bastard. Lucky shot or not, that shot knocked the fucker back a few steps and gave me a chance to scramble away. Unfortunately, I didn't... It... I didn't get back on my feet before it was coming at me again. Kicking up dust as it closed in, the thing screamed and launched itself at me. The moment its feet hit the ground, I heard the shotgun blast and a ball of fire knocked that piece of shit out of the air. Quickly shifting my attention to the left, I could see Phil running and blasting the thing with a barrage of dragon's breath rounds. I guess the attack caught it off guard because it took off running with Phil right behind it yelling. Fuck yeah, get you some! As he kept dumping rounds into the fucking thing. As the two of them vanished around the corner, 
I let out a sigh of relief and flopped flat on my back. I laid there listening to Phil, who was apparently having the time of his life. Meanwhile, I was pretty sure I shit myself. When the shooting stopped, I got to my feet and dusted myself off, and after a few seconds, Phil came racing around the corner yelling, Go, go, go! As he sprinted past me, I looked back in time to see four or five of those things turning the corner. No questions asked. I turned and took off running as those things started screaming. We cut through three rows before the second set of screamers cut us off. We were running out of time. They had us trapped. The rig in front of us had a gap between the cab and, and its load. If we moved fast enough, we could climb up and have the high ground on the trailers. Nudging Phil, I pointed, then got busy climbing. I guess he got the message because he followed me. Now the drones had to climb up to us. The narrow walkway became a kill zone. I emptied my shotgun into the crowd while Phil reloaded his. When mine went dry, he stepped up and took the other. That created a natural rhythm between us, and we continued that way until there were no drones left standing. Staring down at the pile of things, bodies, whatever you want to fucking call them, my mind kept playing tricks on me. The second I'd see twisted machines made it our image. In the blink of an eye, they would be normal men and women left dying in the dirt. It was so real, I could smell blood in the air and hear them gasping out their last breaths. It wasn't till Phil pointed in the distance. God, it wasn't until Phil pointed into the distance and shouted, There she blows! <sighs> that I, I came back to reality. Taking my attention off the bodies, I looked to where Phil was pointing and he spotted his truck. Holy fucking shit, you were right. Now what? There's a lot to ground to cover. Which building do you think they would keep Debbie in? From our position on the top of the truck, we had a decent view of the place. Phil slowly turned, scanning each building, finally stopping and pointing at the one closest to the river. Right there. That's the old receiving area. It's got the most storage space. A pal of mine used to work here. They said they've got freight elevators that go deep underground. If she's anywhere, she'll be there. My head was spinning. For a second, I felt like I was going to... I, I was in a fucking video game. We just gunned down a bunch of... fucking twisted android robots. And now we're talking about storming an underground lair? This is fucking nuts! God. Well, on the other hand, Phil had been right about everything so far. The question was, should I follow this guy I barely know into a building I'd, I'd, I'd never go into to rescue a person I'd never met? No. The answer is no. I shouldn't do any of this fucking shit. But what was I going to do? Yeah, I was. The truth is, having a goal was the only thing keeping me from losing my mind. I, if it wasn't for Phil and his quest, I would have given up a long time ago. Nodding in agreement, I reloaded 
Then we climbed down and got moving. The path we were taking ran by Buddy, so I thought it would be a good idea to grab more ammo. Unfortunately, things didn't work out that way. My Suburban and everything in it was gone. I'd seen it from the top of the rig, but somewhere between climbing down and cutting through the truck maze, it had vanished. They took it! Fuck! Those dirty, rotten, motherfucking son of a bitch, android cock sucking assholes! Motherfuckers! We're done. We're done. We're fucking done! We've got next to no ammo left and no way out of here. Fucking goddamn son of a bitch mutant fucktards! Phil laughed, then started going through his fanny pack, counting shells. Well, you're half right. They took our shit, but we've got a way out. Porkchop will get us anywhere we need to go. Now all we gotta do is grab Debbie and hit the road. What if she's not in there or worse? What if she is fucking one of them? Use your goddamn head, asshole. We gotta get the fuck out of here. Thinking over the question for a second, Phil nodded and zipped up his pack and took a deep breath. If she ain't there, we'll go. But I gotta be sure. You understand that, right? I can't go without at least trying to find her. If it goes the other way, and she ain't herself, I'll handle it. No matter what. After this, we're done. And got my word on that. He was right. I did understand. He needed to know if she was alive. With that said, we headed out. It was a good distance between the truck yard and the old receiving building. Most of it was out in the open. We had to cross the road, then cut through a refueling station before we hit the first buildings. As we passed the first of the three buildings, I heard something. It came from above us. And then we reached the edge of the building we both stopped and looked up, but it was impossible to see up there. After standing still for a long moment without a sound coming back, we got moving again. We'd made it halfway past the building when we heard it again. I recognized the sound this time. It was footsteps. There were, there were footsteps coming from the roof. They're on the... Before I could get the words out, something hit the both of us and put us both on the ground almost at the exact same time. The impact kicked up blinding clouds of dust as childlike giggles echoed around us. Hearing the laugh again instantly put me on alert. The thought of another nut punch made my stomach hurt. Gun up. I tried to focus on movement. Before I could lock in on anything, Phil shouted. Get out here, you fugly piece of... A loud smack cut him off, and then he yelled. Son of a bitch! One of the little turds just slapped me! A smile eased its way onto my face. I was a second away from laughing, then something brushed against the inside of my left ankle. My instant reaction was to look down. When I did, my heart stopped. There, lying between my legs, looking up at me, was one of the fucking shining twins. Most of her body was behind me, so all I saw was her head and shoulders, but that was enough. She was in the perfect position to ruin me. 
Another shot to my sack from that angle would be the end. I'd probably just lay down and die. I'm mad enough to admit. I screamed like a little girl and tried to dive away, but she caught my foot. My momentum broke her grip and I hit the ground scrambling to my feet, trying to get away from her. At this point, most of the dust was settled and I could see Phil. The twin he squared off against was running circles around him, making it impossible, impossible for him to get a good shot. I had to give him credit. He wasn't wasting rounds. He was waiting for the right moment. There was no time to focus on him. I dropped my shotgun and dove. I was in trouble. I was still scrambling trying to get to my feet. I pulled my Norinko. I turned in time to see Thing 2 running at me. Muscle memory kicked in. I used the Norinko more than any of my other guns. It was like an extension of my arm, switching to a shooting stance. I hit her with a double tap to the chest, which slowed her down. Then I fired again and hit her in the head. It was hands down the coolest thing I'd ever done and I felt fucking horrible for doing it. Robot or not, it, I just shot a kid in my brain and I couldn't handle it. As the thing stood there looking at me, it was still trying to fucking talk. I got a boo. Jesus fucking Christ. It was a fucking little sim pal Cindy. Oh my fucking God. Then the goddamn thing toppled over and fell on the ground. Phil eventually walked over to me. I was standing there looking at the damn little thing I shot as it laid on the ground. And he looked at the girl and chuckled. Fucking Grady's. Hell yeah, you got one. Damn toasters are tough. I blew that thing's legs off and it still got away. I'm surprised that pea shooter you're packing popped her top like that. I was pretty sure she'd be knee deep in your shit shoot by now. Nice shooting. I could hear what he was saying, and I knew I should respond, but my mouth wouldn't form the words. Realizing I wasn't all the way there, Phil waved his hand in front of my face and snapped his fingers to get me to look at him. Shake that shit off. She ain't a real person. Come on, man, you can't get stuck on stupid every time you put one of them down. Clench your cheeks, grit your teeth, and power through. You can wig out when we're done. For now, stick to the script and get this over with so we can ride out. He was right. I needed to keep my head in the game. Once he was sure I was back on task, we moved out. As we passed the second building, I glanced back and stopped walking. The body was gone. As crazy as, as, crazy as it sounds, I was a little relieved, but mostly I was horrified. The twins were still out there, and the thought of going through that again made me fucking want to puke again. Shaking it off, I, I picked up my pace and jogged to catch up with Phil. When I told him about it, he just shrugged it off and said, meh, it didn't matter. We weren't here to exterminate them. We were here for Debbie and his truck. Looking at it that way put my mind at ease for some reason. And before I knew it, we were at the old receiving building. Sadly, my moment of relaxation didn't last long.
the second we stepped through those doors. I was right back where I started. The place was old and run down. Everything was covered in dust. Despite that, I was more nervous now than I was when we were outside. Everything around this building felt wrong. All I wanted to do was get the fucking hell out of there. The first part of the building was an office space with a break room, a couple of restrooms, and the, the lobby. Nothing spectacular, but, but as we made our way through, I realized the lights were still on. The lights didn't necessarily mean anything, but it struck me as odd that a building no one was using had power. When we got to the freight elevators, everything was still okay. We got in and saw the control panel. It was brand new without a speck of dust on it. As a matter of fact, the entire elevator looked like it had been recently cleaned. I looked at the control panel and then it fell and shook my head. This is a horrible fucking idea. We shouldn't do this. While reaching out to hit the button, Phil looked at me and said, What's this? The control panel had a level on it that said sub-level 47. I, I just didn't know what to say. This was a fucking horrible idea. This... We should not be doing this because this is... Attention, attention, breach in sector 005. Anomaly number 37 has been detected in zone 47, section B. All units converge to section B to detain and capture the human. Anomaly number 37 must be taken alive for study and processing. Anomaly number 37 is hostile and well armed. Category 5. Proceed with caution. Repeat. Anomaly number 37 is extremely hostile. Category 5. An alarm and announcement started to blare interrupting me and the elevator started to move. Any thoughts I had about turning back flew right out the window as we descended into the bowels of the building. Breathing heavily and backing away from the door, I checked my weapons and then closed my eyes and tried to calm down. Concentrating on breathing and relaxing wasn't easy, but between the alarm and the movement of the elevator, it was nearly impossible. Just when I thought I had it under control, the elevator came to a stop. When the doors opened, my world slipped into slow motion. The thunderous sound of my heart racing turned. The alarms into a background noise. Ahead of us was a wide hallway lined with aquariums. Uh, with, with a serious expression, Phil turned to me and spoke in a low voice, snapping me out of it. Stay here. Keep this door open till I find something to put in the way. We gotta make sure this thing doesn't close up on us and leave us while we're looking around. Without waiting for a response, he stepped out and took off. Once he disappeared around the corner, I stood in the doorway and zoned out, staring at the tanks. They were alive with all sorts of exotic fish I had never seen before. There was something almost hypnotic about them. I'm not sure how long I stood there before I caught a glimpse of movement further down the corridor. I was just about... I... I was just a flash it, it it was just a flash but I could have sworn I 
saw a cat zip by one of the tanks. I stared down there for a long time, waiting to see it again, but it never came back. A short while later, Phil returned, carrying a small wooden crate. What's in the box? He shrugged and sat it in the entrance. Hell if I know, there's a bunch of them back there. Just grabbed one. Should we open it? For what? Who gives a shit what's in it? We just needed it to hold the door. Quit stalling and let's go. This place is pretty big. We'll get through it faster if we split up. Oh, fuck no. That never works. We stay the fuck together. Fine, whatever, let's go. These fish are creeping me out. I feel like they're watching us. I didn't understand what he meant until we got moving. The fish were all swimming in the same direction we were going. No matter which haul we took, the fish would immediately start tracking us. That, the crazy thing is, they stopped when we stopped. And when we would look at them, they would swim around like they were following us. I'm about 90% sure they were all fake, but we didn't do anything to find out. There wasn't much else on the floor other than a couple of storage areas and the lab filled with empty freezers. There were no signs of the cat and we didn't run into any trouble, but something did happen. An announcement joined the alarm. A familiar voice was now chiming in every few minutes to say. Breach in sector 0001, contain. Breach in sector 0001, contain. It was unnerving. But I, I recognized that voice, but I just couldn't place it. It sounded so goddamn familiar. I'll try not to think about it. We went back to the elevator and headed to the next floor. The trip from the lobby to the first stop hadn't taken long, but for some reason, getting to the next level was taking a while. After a minute or so, I was starting to wonder how deep we were going. I remember reading at the top, sub-level 47. What was this place for? Why does it go so fucking deep underground? At that second, the alarm just stopped and the quiet was deafening. I didn't know what to say. Thinking about my question for a second, Phil scratched his beard. I ain't sure. It can't be too deep. We're right on the river. This might be the last stop. Probably why it's taking so long. You all right? Looking kind of shaky over there. I almost laughed at the question. Am I all right? Fuck no, I'm not all right. Are you? Why isn't any of this bothering you? Look at what we're doing. Normal people don't do this type of fucking shit. This is goddamn insane. We should not be here. Phil stood there looking at me for a long second, then raised an eyebrow and smirked. You're right and wrong at the same damn time. This ain't normal and yeah, it is insane. It's fucking nuts. But I tell you, 
The ding of the bell cut him off as the elevator finally came to a stop. Bringing his gun up and stepping back, he grumbled. We'll talk later. As the door started to open, following his lead, I stepped back and got ready. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The room was massive. To the right, there was a section marked 01101. There was, there was a three-story structure with no windows and a ramp leading to a set of roll-up doors. Across from it, there was an area with no markings, but there were racks that went from the floor to ceiling. Each rack held large white containers that were stored like books on a shelf. There had to be hundreds of them. The containers all had a black panel across the top with two lights, a blue dot and a green circle. I wasn't sure what either of them meant, but they stuck out to me. At the end of each row, there were servers connected to each level of the racks. The third area was to the far left, and it was the strangest of them all. It was a wide open space parked with those old school buses. It, it kind of looked like, like a sound stage that you see on television. From where we were standing, I could make out an office, someone's living room, and what looked like a, a whole goddamn apartment. Looking at all three sections, Phil pointed to where I was staring. You check that section, and I'll hit the middle one. We'll meet back here and do the last one together. I already know what you're gonna say, but we don't have time. We gotta split up so we can speed through this. If you need me, holler. I'll come running. Same goes the other way. If you hear me yelling, I'll ass over to wherever I'm at. My section's a little smaller than yours, so if I finish first, I'll come find you. Giving me a quick nod, he jogged off towards the racks before I could say anything. As he disappeared down the first row, I took a deep breath and got moving. The closer I got to my section, the more I realized this was a bad choice. There were dozens of sets. Some of them were huge. There was no way I'd get through all of them alone. The first set I came to was the office I seen from the elevator. The part of it that grabbed my attention had been the windows. The view was of Las Vegas and it was moving. The windows were actually just screens playing what looked like a live feed. If it, it, if it weren't for the fact that I could turn around and see where I really was, I, it, it would have seemed like I was really in Vegas. Out of, out of the first three, this was the biggest set. It was also the most detailed. I had to find the button to buzz myself in the rear. The one, that one took a little problem solving. I couldn't press the button and open the door at the same time. In the end, I tapped the button down and hurried through the door before it could close. When the door closed behind me, I was surrounded by the illusion, the effect of it, really kicked in. By the time I'd searched the first of the six smaller offices, I was l losing grip on real reality. I caught myself watching birds fly past the window and, and occasionally glancing down at traffic on the street. At one point, I actually stopped to watch some of the ladies crossing the street talking amongst themselves trying very hard to shake it off. I got back on track and cleared the next two offices without stopping. As I stepped out into the hall, 
The sound of a door opening to my right made my heart jump. I quickly raised the Norinko. I turned and took aim at the first thing I saw and froze. A man wearing a white polo shirt and tan slacks walked by carrying a stack of papers. I guess he didn't notice me because he casually strolled to the copy machine and started loading up. Also at that moment, I thought I had heard a cat. When, when he finished and turned to face me and stopped, I hadn't seen his face until then, but that moment I saw him, I knew he wasn't real. His eyes were too far apart, and one was higher than the other. Uh, on the top of his forehead, he had an odd etched symbol there, and he also had an odd sort of blank smile, and he was also constantly blinking. The combination made it hard to look directly at him, and when I did, I felt confused. It was like his face was fucking with my brain, and, and I didn't like it. We stood there watching each other for a second before he opened his mouth and spoke. Well, sorta. He stood there with his mouth open, and the words came out of his throat, but his lips didn't move. Breach in Sector 0001, contain. And that voice sounded so goddamn familiar again. But those were his last words. For once, I wasn't waiting to be attacked. Bringing up the shotgun, I pulled the trigger as the barrel reached his chin level. At that point-blank range, it was instant devastation. The blast obliterated his head. The now mostly headless drone smoked. No sound came from it. Its arms flailing for a moment, then it dropped to its knees and fell on its back. There was an odd moment of silence while I stood there staring at it. That overwhelming surge of emotions I'd felt after shooting my first drone was gone. It had been replaced by a twisted combination of joy and fear. I was happy to be alive, but scared shitless when I thought about what might happen next. Trying my best to stay calm, I finished searching the set and moved on. The next few sets were small. I didn't have to go in to see there was nothing there. Picking up the pace, I hurried through, quickly scanning over the smaller sets till I came to one that stopped me in my tracks. I, I, I just couldn't fucking believe what I was seeing. It was brick on brick down to the last damn detail. My house. They even had my Suburban sitting in the driveway. Of course, all of the guns and supplies were gone, but it was still there. Smiling, I hurried over to the driver's side and winced. When I saw that there was no dent in the door, the window wasn't damaged. As I reached out to touch it, movement in the window of my house caught my attention. Without thinking, I brought up the gun and turned to face my house. As soon as I focused on the window, my heart dropped. My... My popo... My cat... was sitting in the window, looking at me. Seeing him made me realize I had checked on him since all this shit started. 
I was so excited to see him. I rushed to the front door and went inside. They hadn't missed a single detail. It even smelled like my house. I was so amazed by it all. I stood there a while, and Mr. Poe purred and was brushing against my leg. I was so happy to see him. I reached down and scooped him up and went over and took a seat on my sofa, laughing and playing with my baby. I got lost in the moment till it dawned on me. None of this was real. If none of this was real, then this cat in my lap must be. But before I could finish my thought, a voice startled startled me from behind. What are you doing in my house? Grabbing my gun and getting up fast as I could, I turned to see I was standing in my living room, staring at a warped version of myself. It had all my features, but they were slightly off and its skin looked waxy. I almost in a panic, then it locked eyes with me and stepped back. What the fuck am I looking at? Aiming my gun at him, I stepped around the sofa as a blinding rage surged through me. No, 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 you're not me. You're not, you're not me. Calm down, calm down. Don't do anything crazy. We can work this out. As those words left his mouth, it swatted the barrel of the gun away and punched me in the face. Eyes watering and nose bleeding. I staggered back and accidentally squeezed off a round. The recoil from the blast threw me off balance practically turning me away from the thing in front of me. Thankfully, I managed to stay upright and my vision cleared. But what what I saw made me wish I was blinded again. In a state of shock, it took a second to wrap my mind around the sight of myself crawling across the floor. The shot I let off had hit the thing's hip partially, and his right leg was not working, it was smoking. It was a grisly sight, but the sounds it was making made it much worse. Its voice it skipped like a scratched record, and it said, I, I don't want to die. Critical error. I don't want to die. Critical error. Critical error. Its voice sounded like it was winding down as I stepped up and blew its head off with a blast from the shotgun. standing there staring at it. I staggered back off and off the set and puked my fucking guts out. When I finished, I started crying. I couldn't help it. The trauma of murdering myself was too much. Legs wobbly and weak. I took a seat on the porch and tried to pull myself together. I'm not sure why, but that moment I realized the alarm was off and it the silence that goddamn creepy silence from the beginning <sighs> but in the distance I could hear, 
hear Phil's gunshots. For whatever reason, that combination seemed to bring, bring me back to the task at hand. Wiping tears from my eyes, I grabbed my shotgun and started replacing the rounds I'd spent as I slipped in the second shell. A high-pitched growl of an angry cat caught my attention. Looking up from what I was doing, I could see Mr. Poe standing a few feet away from me in full attack mode. I never saw him like that, and it sent a chill through me. Trying not to make any sudden moves, I slowly got to my feet, praying he didn't come at me. Once I was standing, things went from bad to worse. Another growl from behind me caused me to glance back over my shoulder and do a double take. There was a second. Mr. Poe was coming towards me. If that wasn't bad enough, a third hopped up on my suburban and hissed. Oh, fuck me. Don't do it. Please, just go away. I, I can't. The one behind me launched itself into the air, but I managed to dodge out of the way. As it landed, the others came racing at me. I, I couldn't shoot these... I, sh I couldn't shoot these cats. I knew they were robots, but I just couldn't do it. I ran. They were coming from everywhere. One turned. Two. Three. Ten of them. Oh my God, there was at least a dozen. I wasn't fast enough to outrun them. They clawed and bit me till I was left with no choice. I had to defend myself. They were on me in a heartbeat. I thrashed around kicking some and swatting others till I was able to get off a shot. The effect of the shotgun blast to something that small was a horrible thing. Robots or not, seeing their little bodies disintegrate like that was disturbing. I didn't even realize I'd been screaming until the gun ran empty and I was surrounded by kits of robo, by bits of robo kitties. I knew they weren't real, but in my mind, all I could see was blood and fur and guts. I hadn't emptied my stomach. Earlier, I would have been spewing all over the place, swallowing the lump in my throat. I unzipped my fanny pack and started reloading the shotgun with my last six shells. I just inserted the last one. Phil came strolling up, carrying something. From a distance, it was hard to make out, but it, as he got closer, I saw what he had. He was carrying heads. He was carrying the heads of the twins that had been following us. He tied their ponytails together and was holding them up like trophies for me to see. Guess who I ran into? Who's laughing now, you little shits? Looks like you've been busy. What's all this? Looking around at the scattered parts of tufts of hair, I blankly said, My cat. Phil looked at me, then at the mess, and slowly nodded his head. All of that from one cat? Damn. No. Well, yeah, but no. There were a lot of them. But it was one cat. Tossing the heads down, Phil paused and shrugged. Doesn't make a lick of damn sense to me, but whatever. Let's go. I may have started a little fire back there, and I'm pretty sure something's about to... Do that. 
Get a move on. We gotta wrap this up before the fire spreads. He wasn't getting an argument from me. I was more than ready to get the fuck out of there. We cleared the next few sets with no problem. As we reached the last of them, there was a pop somewhere behind us, and Phil hit the ground screaming. Before my brain could register what was happening, there was another pop, and I was knocked off my feet. When I hit the ground, the pain kicked in. A searing hot wave of agony radiated through my left leg. I didn't fully understand what was happening until a third round zipped by. Someone was shooting at us. And they had a silencer on the pistol. Alarms started blaring again. This time, the pistol shots were much louder. We could feel them whizzing past us. <laughs> the building was filling with smoke. The perfect combination of chaos to cap off the fact that we'd both been shot. With everything happening so fast, I hadn't really kept an eye on Phil. I was too worried about the next shot to focus on him. I still hadn't seen where the shooter was, but it didn't matter. I had to get out in the open, crawling as best as I could. I managed to get onto a set designed to look like a strip club. Using a tablecloth, I snatched off one of the tables. I hid behind the stage and did what I could to stop the bleeding. I just finished tying off my leg when the sound of footsteps caught my attention. From where I was hiding, I could see a small section of the hallway. The second I focused on it, a figure stepped into the opening and looked directly at me. It was her, the woman from the gas station. My moment of recognition was cut off when she brought up the rifle she was holding in one hand and a pistol in the other. She fired the pistol. The bullet took a chunk out of one of the speakers and I was able to scramble away before she got off a second shot. I couldn't tell which was worse. The fact that she had guns or that she wasn't saying anything in the movies, the bad guys always give a speech while they're tracking someone down. A part of me wished she'd say something just to break the tension. Pain from the hole in my leg was making, making it hard to get around. I crawled past the DJ's booth and was near the edge of the set when she fired another shot. This one grazed my shoulder and clipped my left ear as it zipped by. Adrenaline and fear made one hell of a painkiller. At that moment, I couldn't feel a thing. Unfortunately, I, it didn't kick in soon enough and now it was too late. Closing the distance between us, she kicked me in the ribs. Oh, and then shocked me with a wand stick in the back of the head, and everything went black. I wasn't out for long. When I came to, she was dragging me into the elevator, and most of the room was on fire. The first thing I heard was her voice. Anomaly 37 has been obtained. Proceeding to extract Alpha 1701. Sector 0001 has been compromised and structural failure is imminent. God, there was something so familiar about her voice. I knew I had heard it somewhere before, blinking a few times. I glanced up at her in time to see a 
shotgun blast knock her off her feet. Still groggy and in a shitload of pain, I slowly turned my head and focused on a dark shape coming towards us. I didn't realize who it was until I heard him say, Damn, I thought I was jacked up. You look like shit. It was Phil. He had what looked like a bloody pillow duct taped to his side, and he was pale as a ghost. If I didn't feel like I was dying, I would have laughed. I managed to smirk, but it was quickly canceled out by the robot tackling him as the elevator door slid shut. It took everything in me to get to my knees and press the button to reopen them, but when they did, I was met by flames and both of them were gone. There wasn't much I could do. Stepping off of that elevator would have been certain death. I tried calling his name, but the roar of the fire and the rolling black smoke told me it was pointless. I kept the doors open as long as I could, but the heat was overwhelming. I was left with no choice. I closed the doors and pressed the button. Using the handrail, I struggled to get to my feet and stood against the back wall. I had no idea what was waiting for me. For all I knew, there would be an army of those fucking goddamn androids ready to tear me apart. Pulling the pistol and thumbing off the safety, I closed my eyes till the bell dinged on the top floor. When the doors opened, so did my eyes, and to my surprise, there was no one there. Once I stepped out, I looked around, looking, overlooking the river. It was so close, I could smell the water. I was almost to the exit when a small explosion rocked the building, and the thick black smoke filled the lobby and it was followed by another. It was hard to see, even harder to breathe, but I hobbled my way through it. When I burst through the doors and the rush of fresh air almost made me gasp. I, I'd maybe taken four or five steps before another explosion. <laughs> out but when I came to the police and paramedics were everywhere when I tried to bring my hand up to rub my eyes my arm stopped I was handcuffed to the stretcher before I could ask any questions one of the EMT shouted he's awake then slapped an oxygen mask on me once they had me loaded into an ambulance they injected me with something for the pain, and we were off. Whatever they gave me, it kicked in quick. All I could do was lay there listening to the radio. Unfortunately, the guy driving was a Max Truth fan. Remember... You heard it here first, folks, and that's the whole truth. The madman that's terrorized our town for the last 48 hours has been apprehended. For legal reasons, I can't disclose this scumbag's name at this time. But I can say, the hunt is over. Here's what we know so far. There are five, count them. Five victims and two massive fires attributed to this piece of human filth. I, for one, hope they put him in the deepest, darkest hole they can find and throw away the key. We'll keep you updated at MaxTruth.com. We also have exclusive footage from the crime scenes that you won't find anywhere else. 
As usual, it's free. Because the truth shouldn't cost a thing. We'll be right back. After this short break. I guess I must have passed out after that. Because the next thing I knew, I was in the hospital. I stayed there under 24 hours under police surveillance till I was well enough to be arrested. I was charged with five counts of murder and two counts of arson. Thanks to my story, I was found unfit to stand trial and I was committed to the Smith's Grove Sanitarium for the criminally insane for the rest of my life. Things moved slowly after that. Days turned to weeks. Then somewhere around two months in, I received my first visitor. It was in the day room and I was strapped to a chair. I was shocked. My family had turned their backs on me and I didn't have a lot of friends, so I had no clue who it would be. After waiting about 10 minutes, the door opened and Phil walked in. I was so happy to see him. I almost jumped out of my seat, but I realized I couldn't because I was handcuffed to the chair. Holy shit, you're alive. You gotta get me out of here. You gotta tell them what happened. He gave me a concerned look, but didn't say anything. Calmly, taking a seat across from me, he stretched out. Ah. Petted and combed his neatly trimmed beard, then dusted some lint off of his sleeve. Once the door shut, we were alone. He looked at me and shook his head. Good seeing you again. I wanted to come and thank you personally. The raw data you provided helped accomplish something truly magnificent. Wait, what? What? Why are you talking like that? Stop fucking around and get me out of here. Okay, Timothy. <clears throat> okay, Tim. Is this better? Out? No, no. No, my friend. You won't be leaving here anytime soon. As I was saying, you've helped us significantly. And as a show of gratitude... He paused to wave to the camera. And on cue, the door opened. And in walked a woman and stood by the door. My immediate reaction was to jump out of my seat and retreat to the far wall, putting distance between us. She smiled and nodded at me and at Phil. This is Debbie. She's the administrator here and a close personal friend. Don't you worry. She'll take good care of you. On that note, I'll leave you two to get better acquainted. With that, he walked out, leaving us alone. All I could do was stare at her. She looked so goddamn familiar. I know if it was because she'd, she'd haunted my dreams or the last few weeks or if I'd seen her before. My mind was overwhelmed with questions, but all I managed to say was, who? Oh, who are you? I... I've... heard your voice before. With a smile, Debbie nodded and took a seat. Relax. I'm not here to hurt you. I've been monitoring you for some time now. I have been recording your responses and reactions to stimuli, and over the course of time, I have mapped out your personality. I am a surveillance model, after all. 
To answer your question, yes, you know me, and you know my voice. To you, I am known as Duchess of Darkness. But from now on, you will call me Dr. Rendell. Uh, no, I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. No! No! I, I just can't believe it. No! 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 As they were dragging me out of the room, Phil was standing in the hallway and turned to look at me and there was an audible pop as his eyes began glowing red. No! Well now, it looks like Tim has reached the end of the line. What will he do now? Only time will tell. It makes me wonder if my friends and co-workers and family are what they appear to be. I'll have to give that some further thought. In the meantime, I want to thank you for joining me here at Dark and Disturbed Tales. I am your host, Steve. Oh, what the hell? I am trying to get this afterward done for Beatles fan eyes, and someone is interrupting me. <sighs> yes, can I help you? Mr. Steve Taylor, your replacement is being prepared. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs>